Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. I was being exchanged sexually for the education or lack thereof that I was receiving uh, and my siblings were receiving from this person. And I didn't realize until years later on that this is something called familial trafficking, mm. where a family member will use another family member as payment. And I hadn't even received sex education yet. And I'm explaining in graphic detail what is happening to me. And so to get me to shut up, she sat in on a lesson with me and she goes, see, nothing happened. Oh my gosh. Don't ever talk about this ever again. And she needed that to stay hidden because otherwise her free piano lessons for myself and my siblings would be taken away. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening on the podcast apps and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. You can become a subscriber, a supporter. We are so close to 100,000 subs, guys. I'm just over the moon excited with how many people want to join in and support the cause and be advocates for these people who are coming on and sharing their stories. Also, if you comment, it's it's really amazing for us, for the guests, and for the algorithm. So today's guest, I think actually one of you guys sent me her info a few months ago. It took a while to connect, but I'm so happy that we did. She has a platform where she talks about growing up in a family cult and being trafficked by her own mother. We're also going to be talking about her upbringing in the independent fundamentalist Baptist church in Japan. So we have lots of different things here going on. I'm so excited to get into it. Thank you so much for joining us, Asami Dane. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just really honored that you would have me on your show. And I think it's really cool that uh, you have listeners that connected us together. And it's interesting to see how our circles coincide and how so many of the survivors who were listening to your content were also following along on my journey as well. So I'm really glad that we connected and yeah. so grateful to be on your show. Thank you so much. And I just think it's really beautiful how these these ex-cult survivors can come together and talk to each other and relate to each other. And they may grow up in totally different sides of the world and even in different high demand groups, but there's such a through line with everybody and what they had yeah. to go through, the traumas and, and the healing process. So we love to spread awareness. And that's why I love you guys too, to give me some suggestions because it seems like once we have someone on, we always have people in the comments going, oh, I was waiting for you to interview that person. And I'm like, you gotta let me know because sometimes I don't know that they exist, you know? So we love your suggestions. Thank you guys. Okay, Sami, let's start with your childhood then, I guess, Ooh. and what it was like growing up independent fundamentalist Baptist. We haven't talked about this one at all and it has been a hot topic people have been asking. So I'm so happy that we can kind of dive into it. Yeah, thank, thank you for, you know, having this as one of the topics. Um, I think when people hear the words independent fundamental Baptist, they're a little confused because if you've never been part of this group, you're thinking, okay, are you Baptist? What are you? Are you all the same? So there is Baptist, which is a denomination. There's fundamental Baptist, and then there is independent fundamental Baptist. So it's like three degrees into this thing. And especially in the United States, it is a widespread religion, uh, which primarily takes its ideology from the Bible. And now it depends on which church you go to. Not all of these churches teach the same. So what these organizations or these church preachers pride themselves in is not having any type of structural organization that they report to. For example, the Southern Baptist movement has a lead organization. They usually send out their curricular materials to the various churches that report back to them. They have leadership summits, all of those things. Independent Baptist churches, though, or independent fundamental Baptist churches don't have any of that structure. So they pride themselves in that. Um, most of the time, 
They are very dogmatic in their beliefs. Um, it's kind of an us for no more mentality. It's our church. Everybody else is an outsider. It's a very secluded group per church. Now, some of them will work together if they are having some sort of missions conference where people of, quote, like faith come together and usually argue about the same things. <laughs> Uh, usually politics, but they'll come together and have these discussions or support various missionaries that they re recommend to each other. And that's how our family was tied to all of this. But having that religion overseas was a, another interesting dynamic. Yeah. So while it is mostly in the U.S., there are several missionaries that have come to Japan with those ideologies. And that's how... My family kind of got sucked into all this. My mom was part of that group and she came to Japan and my dad, who is Japanese, met her in one of those churches and that's how they got connected. Oh, your mom was a missionary. She was, yeah. Wow, how interesting. Could you give us a little bit of a rundown just so I have a full picture because I'm new to this religion as well. What are some of the rules, some of the things that kind of define independent fundamentalist Baptist? How much time do we have? <laughs> I could literally write a book. Um, well, for starters, usually they're more modest. Most of the time, again, every church is different. And as, as crazy as this is going to sound, I have been to independent fundamental Baptist churches who are nothing like the way I grew up. Okay. So I have to be very careful when I say this. And Although I would personally never go back to an independent fundamental Baptist church just because traditionally there's a lot of things I, I can't support. Mm -hmm. it, I don't think it would be fair for me to lump every single one into one category. However, I'm just going to speak from a majority standpoint here. The majority is that women are not allowed to wear pants. Mm. So no pants for women. Uh, it means no jeans, um, no workout clothes. Most of the time, women are not allowed to go to the beach or go to swimming pools, theaters, movie theaters were considered a place of depravity, just corruption. Interesting. You know, just various things like that. Of course, alcohol is a big no-no, but I think that's more common in a lot of other uh, places as well. Um there's a lot of focus on the leader of that church. So that leader is is pretty much God. It's your tie to God. If if that person says this is the interpretation of scripture, you listen to that person. Mm. There's a lot of clicks within those types of churches. Usually if you go to independent fundamental Baptist church, there is the pastor and then there is deacons, of course, but then there is the favorite family. And nobody will outright call it this, but this is the cool person, the, the couple. Usually they'll have like a couple of kids. They're the role model of the church and you have to strive to be like them. And if, if you're not the favorite, then you're kind of like outcasted mm. and you don't get invited to ladies luncheons. It's very clicky, very, you know, it's just, it's icky. It really is. But a lot of it is focused on outward appearance. So everything you do is about how you are perceived. Um, are you going to look like a quote Christian? That's pretty much everything this is focused around outward appearances. So what would make one look like a Christian in that way? Is it just the modest dress? Is it the way you do your makeup? Can you wear makeup? It depends. So some churches, no makeup, no jewelry, nothing. Very, you know, standard. Um, uniformity all across the board. Now, where I was um, in the churches we went to, they were okay with makeup so long as there was no, like no color eyeshadow or anything. Uh, your nail polish had to be natural colors. Your clothing, and here was the confusing part, especially in my home, is sometimes your skirt, as long as it covered the knee, you were okay. Mm. But depending on my dad, who was the pastor, how his mood was, if your skirt didn't cover your calf one day, you might be an immodest person. So it just depended. Again, it's all has to do with the pastor's point of view in most of these places. Um, but a lot of it was modesty. You don't go to people's houses that are 
not living according to the standard unless you are there to convert. evangelize and convert them. <laughs> right. So the only reason you would be friends with someone who is an unbeliever is if you were trying to convert them. And of course, you would report back to your church and say, well, I met with so-and-so, pray for them. They're living an ungodly lifestyle, but I'm witnessing to them and yeah. you know, trying to get them to church. That would be the only reason you'd be friends with someone else. Um, it was also really strict on women. Uh, for for me specifically, I I did go to a religious college, but I went for graphic design communications, and that was even frowned upon because I wasn't doing a uh, study that could be used for ministry later on, mm. like music or teaching or something like that. So it was, it was very strict. That sounds incredibly isolating if you're not allowed to just have friends outside of the church. And also, I see this with Mormonism, too, because we had those same type of things where you can be friends with other people, but you really should be trying to convert them. And it wasn't as strict as you can only be friends if you convert them. But mm. there was still very much that undertone of, so are you bringing them to church or what's going on with that? So I remember feeling like some of those friendships didn't feel necessarily as genuine as I would have hoped because there's that ulterior motive, right? You want yeah. something else out of them other than to just be their friend. And so that's, you know, it's not great for kids to grow up with. One thing, though, your dad was the pastor. So I'm just trying to wrap my brain around this. So your mom was a missionary, converted your dad, and he rose all the way up to pastor. At what point did that happen? Were you already born when he was a pastor or did that happen in your childhood? Well, my dad actually converted prior to meeting my mom. So oh, okay. um, there, right. So there were missionaries already there and that's why she was coming to Japan. So even with um, the way she was coming over, she could not come over as a teacher because she was a woman. So she was coming over as support to that church. So she came over as the church pianist. Oh. Um, and she was allowed to do secretarial work, but she was not allowed to teach unless it was small children. That was the only, only leadership role she was allowed in. So she came over actually because she was expecting a college boyfriend to come over with her. And that's why she came to Japan. Okay. Things didn't work out. She stayed and met my dad um, and they got married later on, but he was already part of this movement. I think it became more extreme once the relationship with my mom started because she has a little bit more extreme views than my dad. And then they came together and it was just an explosion of extremist ideologies. Mm -hmm. um, but they got married and then they eventually decided to both become missionaries. So my parents are fully funded and sponsored by churches in the U.S. Um, my dad is not technically a pastor of a church. He is a missionary, um, which is which is why it gets really sketchy. They had somewhat of a ministry, and I'm putting this in quotes because it was very abusive until I was 15. And then after that... Everyone left because it was so extreme or people moved, whatever reason people had stopped coming to their quote church. But even at the later points of this, we were just meeting in our apartment. It was like two people that would show up again, fully sponsored, fully funded by churches in the U.S. After that point in my life and everybody had left, there was nobody attending at all. And they were still being paid full time to live in their own apartment, which later they inherited my grandmother's house. So it was, it's a full blown scam at this point, oh, wow. but that's kind of how it progressed. And if you ask them today, you know, about their quote ministry, they'll tell you they have a full time ministry and they work so hard and all these things. I think they have fully convinced themselves that they are doing something good, mm. um, but it's in fact, extremely toxic and harmful, but that's kind of how that progression happen with them. Okay. So now that I have a better understanding of the container that you were raised in, let's talk about you specifically and what that was like as a child and how, if you feel that your parents and their beliefs affected the way that they treated you as a child. Oh, definitely. They had an understanding that it was okay to abuse children mm -hmm. so long as you were pointing them in a certain direction. So, and I think a lot of times there's this idea uh, based on what abuse is, right? Yeah. 
Personally, I think if it involves, and this is just me, if it involves any type of physical harm to a child, that is abuse. Uh, emotional harm to a child, that is abuse. Neglect of basic needs, that is abuse. Um, for my home, it was everything from a fist to, um, you know, having meals taken away. Um, sometimes it was, you know, full on just, I, I don't want to get too graphic, but it, it was pretty intense, you know, the physical abuse. There was definitely a lot of emotional abuse as well, especially from my father. Um, he really loved pitting our siblings against each other. My mother did this too, which I'm learning now is a very common trait with narcissistic families. But um, they would love to make us feel very small. And so we would stop questioning what was going on. If there was any questions, in fact, we would get abuse with what was happening. We were also homeschooled, which made it even mm. more confusing. So in Japan, it's technically illegal to homeschool your children. Really? Um, yes, unless there's a few qualifying factors to this. So if a student is receiving abuse at their school and mentally, emotionally, for whatever reason, they can no longer attend, they can then register through the local school board to have tutoring, or I'm sure it's now moved to online. I grew up in the 90s, so it was very different, but the, that was an exception. So for like a mental disorder or um, needing extra assistance or for, for whatever reason, if there was abuse at school and the parents wanted to remove the child. So those, those were some qualifying factors. I grew up with dual citizenship, so that was another qualifying factor. My parents went to the local school district, so the Japanese government, and informed them that my mother was my tutor and that we were receiving curriculums from the United States. Therefore, I was qualified to stay home and receive the same education as if I would going to a Japanese private or public school. Of course, that's a full on, that's a full on lie. Okay. I was going to say, so what were you getting? <laughs> Nothing. Um, I got a book. Yes, there were materials sent in, but truthfully, my education at home was probably at a sixth grade level when I went to college. Wow. It was, here's the textbook. Good luck. I'll give you some answers on test day. If you don't know the material, too bad for you, but we're going to move you on because it looks bad on us if you have a bad grade. Oh. So a lot of times my mom would write my research papers or anything because I didn't know how to do it. And of course, when I would ask, why don't I go to a normal school like everybody else? Because that's where everyone was making friends and having a normal life. They would say things like, oh, you're not smart enough to go to a school. Oh. And if we put you in school, you would be with people. And my dad was very unkind the way he said this, but he would say you basically you would need to be in a special education class. And it was it was awful the way he would say things. And I'm not even going to say the words he said, because that's really not OK. But that's how I was led to believe why I was in this program. Like, oh, I'm just not smart enough. Something's wrong with me. Um, and as an adult, I've realized actually I do have ADHD, which is a whole other subject. But, um, you know, those, those are things that there are education programs for people who have ADHD or who have um, learning disabilities that were available to me mm -hmm. um, should I have needed those things. But it was it wasn't a priority. And um, that's how they got away with a lot of their stuff is it's just kind of keeping us in this little box. So we would never ask questions and no one would be around to ask us questions. Yeah. And it was also really isolating, too, because of the way my my dad growing up when we had this quote ministry, he would rent buildings from either a local library. So in Japan, they have community centers and libraries where you can rent out rooms, kind of like an office space. Um, some people would use it for study spaces. If there's like a university close by, they would rent it on a Sunday afternoon so they could study together. So we would have these church or uh, ministry things going on in these places. And then when I was about eight or nine years old, they started renting a building from a, it was an independent fundamental Baptist church, but it was geared towards a military base. So it was an English speaking church and my father would rent that building that was off base from them during the afternoon so we could meet there. 
And so that was really the only time in my life that I had somewhat consistent friends because in order to keep good relationships with the English speaking church, we were allowed to go to their Sunday morning or Sunday evening services. Mm -hmm. So that's how I made some, some friends there. We were only there for a few years. My dad ended up getting in a fight with the pastor there and we ended up leaving, but um, it was a constant moving, constant struggle. It, one pastor, one person might be good one day. And then if they got in a fight with my parents, they were all of a sudden an evil person. Mm. And so it was really confusing as a kid, wondering, well, who, who can I trust? Who are these people? Um, are my parents right? Are, are they the bad people? I, I didn't know. So it was, it was really isolating, very confusing, and just really a miserable, lonely life, to be honest with you. Yeah, that sounds awful. And I'd like to get yeah. your opinion on if you think that the way your parents treated you was common amongst a specific church group, or if you think that they had their own thing going on, which was amplified by these teachings, these beliefs, the theology. Oof, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I have two people specifically in mind that I know personally um, that are of the independent fundamental Baptist faith, and they are very outspoken about abuse against children. So again, I don't feel comfortable saying that everyone is like this. Again, I would not personally go to this style of church, but um, I would say as a common whole, I. I don't know if you're familiar, I'm sure you are familiar with the um, show Shiny Happy People. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. The Duggars. Yes. Um, uh, I would say a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches, families, movements do adapt the exact same principles and philosophies. So keep abuse quiet. Um, if abuse is necessary to properly raise a child, then by all means, it's used. But it's also something that's not publicly talked about. So it's very taboo, but behind closed doors, it's happening a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Off camera, you had mentioned that you thought maybe it was possible your parents were both narcissists, which I think would definitely play a big role in the way that they treated you and the way they exerted power over you and wanted complete control. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to speak to that? Because I know a lot of people watching have been so curious and anxious about hearing from someone who grew up in what we could call the narcissism cult. So what are your thoughts on that? I think the word narcissism is definitely thrown around a lot. Um, especially with TikTok. And I, I've seen very commonly the word narcissism and gaslighting used interchangeably or used incorrectly. So I do want to be very specific in what I'm saying. The only reason that I am 99% sure that both of my parents are narcissists is um, during my time in therapy. And uh, this is something that's actively part of my life. But uh, my therapist was asking me questions about my parents, you know, like, did they do this? Were, were these things happening on a consistent basis? And according to her evaluation, she said, you know, they're not sitting in front of me, so I can't tell you and diagnose them. But from when everything you are saying, they are the textbook narcissists. I think it's really hard because a lot of times when you are growing up in these narcissistic environments, from the outside, these people look amazing. They have the right type of speech, you know, um, they're raising their children right, whatever that means. Their kids don't disrespect them. You know, a lot of times they are in religious organizations and I think they flock to them because it gives them a sense of self-esteem and power. Yeah. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is narcissism isn't really the um, sense of self-love, it's actually quite the opposite. Someone who hates themselves so much, has so much hate and bitterness in their heart, they are so terrified that the rest of the world will perceive them that way. They will do anything and everything possible to make themselves look perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think it flips back and forth sometimes, um, the narcissist may have other conditions as well, where one day they may think they're God and they're they're elevated and they're like, no one can look down on me. No one can tell me any different. But then later on, it's like so much shame and, oh, well, they're going to see that I'm just bluffing or 
I think there's a lot of confusion with what narcissism actually is. Some people think it's just, oh, you take a lot of selfies or, you know, you're obsessed with yourself, which can play a part into that. But a lot of it is self-hatred. They just hate themselves so much. And it's this fear that someone's going to find me out for who I am and for who I perceive myself to be. And so there's so much cover up and they'll do anything and everything possible. So everyone on the outside will think that they appear to be this godlike image or this perfect image and no one's going to question their cover. So it's a lot of insecurity from the inside and it's a projection of that. I hear people who have survived these types of things say things like, you know, when I was a kid, my mom would just call up our relatives and say these horrible things about us, which my mom would do. She would Skype call people in the US and be like, oh, she's just so defiant this week. I don't know why she doesn't want to dress modestly or appropriately. It's like she wants attention. I mean, she is a teenager, so she probably wants boys to look at her. And I would hear her say these things and feel awful. Yeah. It's like slut shaming for my own mother. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and I, I hear these commonalities, but what's happening is that narcissist or that narcissistic parent is so terrified that other people will think they're a bad parent. They have to make up stories about their own children. So that way people will think that they're not the problem. Right. Um, so there, there is that. And then you add religion into the mix where they now have to appear to be these godly, very spiritual people. That's a whole other slew of problems now because they have to convince other people in authority who are probably doing the same thing, right? That they are somehow in tune with God and very spiritual and doing everything by the book and accordingly, and they would never sin. I think that's also another reason why addiction is so rampant in these types of families, whether it's, you know, substance abuse or there was addiction even in my home that was covered up so much, but they use religion to make themselves look like they had no problems at all. Yeah. They would condemn other people who had any type of substance abuse or any type of addiction because they were the bad people were perfect. Mm-hmm. It's a very confusing, but very, very sad. If you look at the core of it, um, type of person that lives this way. Um, cause truly they hate themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sad. Yeah. And they take it out on other people, especially their kids, mm-hmm. because they're easy targets. And is it true? What I've heard about narcissism specifically is that they thrive off the attention of others. And when that attention starts to wane, they have to figure out ways to get that person back. But then they'll slowly give that person less and less attention to make the other person want them more. So it's kind of like they thrive off people needing them or seeking them. Do you find that true with your parents at all? Oh, definitely. I would see that with the way they treated my siblings. So one day my sister would be perfect and the next day it would be my brother and then it would be back and forth and it would make one of them jealous and make them feel bad and Um, something commonly used with narcissistic families is the term scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So I was the scapegoat of the family. I was the one that would grow up to be a whore or a prostitute um, and probably on drugs somewhere. Uh, I was told that as, as imagine being told that as a nine year old kid, like you're going to be a whore. Um, But yeah, I was the, I was the scapegoat of the family. And depending on the day, my sister or my brother would be the golden child. So they, they didn't really get to know each other very well growing up, but my, my sister and I fought all the time. And it wasn't really, um, you know, a sibling rivalry is normal. You know, like, oh, you know, I can't stand you one day. You have your stuff. You stole my shirt again. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's, nor- that's normal sibling behavior. But for us, it was a whole other level of, will mom and dad love me today? And if they don't, I'm going to screw up your life Mm. and I'm going to make you look so bad because I need mom and dad to love me. So it was this constant animosity between me and my sister. We're best friends now. That's (laughs) good. um, And we've, we've talked about this actually. We're like, why did we hate each other so much? And well, look who the culprit was, but it's this constant tug of war between who's going to love me. And so you as the victim are like, are they going to love me today? Or are they going to accept me today? And you feel like you're not going to be good enough without their acceptance. And then on their side, it's like this power pull of, 
I can control anyone I want to by making them feel inferior if they don't have my blessing, approval, or affection. So it's it's really sad, but I do see that. Yeah. So I'd like to get into if you're comfortable with it. I know, I mean, you have a whole platform that focuses around this, but I know it's a, a delicate topic. The way in which your mom abused you Mm -hmm. and the way that she used you to get what she wanted. And so in whatever way you're comfortable with, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, of course. So my family had a really big focus and emphasis, emphasis on instruments. So anytime we would come back to the U.S. to visit our supporting, sponsoring churches, it was pretty much custom that we would perform for them, instruments, music, singing, whatever it is. And so it was a standard in our home that we had to learn how to play instruments and do it well to impress these churches. So that was a given. Um, I started learning how to play chopsticks on the piano probably at three or four years old. And then it progressed from there to, you like, you have to learn something. Um, I remember practicing the piano anywhere from three to four hours a day, but then only spending like 30 minutes reading a book for education during the day. So you can see what was more important in our family. And when we started going to, or started renting the building from the the military church off base, there was a couple that came to our church. And I want to be very careful with how I say this. The couple had some red flags, one being that they had a son, but were not allowed to be with him. And I know things can happen, but they had left their home country and were not allowed to return and were not allowed to be with their child. Mm. There's some questions there. You know, I'm. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why that might happen, maybe for not even bad reasons, but there should have been some questions asked like, well, why can't you be with your infant son? Why did you have to leave your infant in another country to come here? To give kind of a picture, uh, this couple came from South Korea. Uh, there are many good jobs in South Korea. In fact, if you uh, if someone offered me a job in South Korea, I think I would take it. <laughs> it's just the the country is so advanced, and there's a lot of opportunity there. But they left, and they left their their son there. And when the couple first came to our church, they were just very eager to serve. And it was a husband and a wife. And the wife was a professional piano player. And they played for major brands and companies. I don't know if I can say Mm -hmm. um, brands on this channel, but, you know, they had sponsored deals with these people. And so they were they were really good at their craft. So they volunteered to become the church pianist. My um, mom saw the talent in this person. And once they started offering free piano lessons to not just our family, but to any family that had young kids and only to young kids, specifically to young girls only, um, it kind of got a little weird. Um, Actually, I have a friend that I've talked to recently. She said that the same deal was offered to her mother and her mother actually said no because she didn't trust this person and she knew something was off. My mother, on the other hand, took and grabbed the first opportunity possible with, oh, it's free. Um, This person had already sexually abused me in front of my mom before. Oh my god! So they knew they, my mother knew that this, who this person was and what they were going to do. And this is where I want to be very, very careful. I am an ally I, if you are part of the LGBTQIA community, I love you and I fully support you. And I want you to know that. Um, and so what I'm about to describe is not someone that I believe is a common thing within this community. So please understand where I'm coming from. From what I understand, the wife was questioning or exploring something else in their life. They had a secret girlfriend. The church did not know. I don't think their husband even knew. Um, but they would also explore on me and I'm not going to get into full details. There was a lot of stuff that happened. Um, 
I don't even think they deserve to be part of the LGBTQ community. Quite honestly, they were a child molester. Let's just put it that way. Um, they don't, they do not represent the people that I know that are good people. Um, but my mother knowing this fully gave me over to this person and knew that myself and my siblings would get free piano lessons in exchange for what was happening to me. And, um, this is where it gets really hard for me to talk about sometimes, yeah. but I did go and ask my mom for help. And in my nine year old little mind, I was like, Oh, if I tell mom, I, I know, I know she's seen some things. She's going to believe me. She's going to listen. Yeah. If I tell her, she's going to make it stop. And I bothered her for weeks and weeks and weeks. Like she's going under my clothes now. She's like, this is happening. And I hadn't even received sex education yet. And I'm explaining in graphic detail what is happening to me. And so to get me to shut up, she sat in on a lesson with me and she goes, see, nothing happened. Oh my gosh. Don't ever talk about this ever again. Now that I look back, I'm like, why did she not want me to talk about this to my dad, to anyone else? Because she knew, she knew exactly what was going on. And she needed that to stay hidden because otherwise her free piano lessons for myself and my siblings would be taken away. And anytime there was piano lessons that she had to pay for, because later on I did get a different teacher, um, she had to pay for them. So this was money in her pocket. And this was something for them to use if we were traveling to the States to perform for people. So it was really messed up, but I was being exchanged sexually for the education or lack thereof that I was receiving uh, and my siblings were receiving from this person. And I didn't realize until years later on that this is something called familial trafficking, mm. where a family member will use another family member as payment or whatever to receive something in exchange for sometimes it, it might be rent or food or clothes or, or whatever that family might be needing or education in my case. But unfortunately it happens more often than we realize. And it wasn't until I started opening up with my story that I'm looking around. I'm like, Oh, it, it wasn't just me. Like there's other people that this is happening to. And I think it's just not commonly talked about. And it wasn't until couple years ago that I fully came to terms with the reality of what was happening. But yeah, it's, it's really sad. Um, you know, before I went through therapy, I was looking at this from a nine year old through however many years I was going through this perspective, like, Oh, why didn't she listen? Well, well, what, maybe if I had said something else, maybe if I had done something else and it wasn't until I went to therapy later on in life that my therapist walked me through all of this and said, you know, I, I was in my late twenties at this point. And she said, okay, your mom was this age. You're this age. If, if somebody came to you, if a child came to you now, that's that same age, you were nine years old and came to you and said, this is happening to me. What would your first reaction be? I'm like, I'll call the police. Right. I call the police. First of all, second of all, I'd probably do something illegal because how dare you touch this child? Yeah. Um, I would definitely never, ever put this kid back in that position ever again. And she goes, that is the logical response. And I thought, oh my gosh. And it, it took me a while to finally bring the pieces together and realize how wrong this was. Cause I'd blame myself for years, but yeah, it was a very, from, from experiencing as a child to having that light bulb as an adult, putting those pieces together, it's, it's been really intense. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking that for one, you had to go through that. Obviously, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, but to know that your mother put you in that situation knowingly, all because she wanted this facade of a perfect family, of a well-rounded, instrumental family. It's just so hard to wrap my brain around to understand why she thinks that that's more important than her own child's safety. It just, it blows my mind. And I know that there's so many factors that go into that when it comes to the religion, if she was, in fact, an, or is a narcissist and all of that. It's just it's hard 
for me and I think a lot of people to really understand what was going on in her mind to make her think that that was okay. And I'm just so amazed at how brave you've been able to be. And I'm so happy that you've been able to get therapy. That's such a huge thing. It's such a big step. And and now you're sharing your story on your platform with over 100,000 followers. And now you are giving voice to other survivors who like you, maybe didn't even understand what was happening to them, knew something was off, but didn't quite understand it was trafficking or didn't know, didn't have the words to put to it. So I just have to commend you for stepping forward and being willing to be that person to stand up and say, hey, guys, this is what's happening around the world. This is wrong. This is what I went through because I know that that's not easy to do. Thank you. I I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So You went through this for a few years, and I know that you ended up at a religious college, right? A Bible school. So I'm I'm curious to know, I know that you were isolated within this community and you didn't have much of an education outside of the homeschooling and you were isolated from other people and friends. But it seems like you you took that in, right? You doubled down on your faith, so to speak, and you were willing to go to a specific school for religion. So I'd love to get into your brain and into what you're thinking and and how you're feeling, if you really are invested or if you're just trying to force it and make it work. What's going through your mind at this point? Truthfully, I didn't have a choice of where I I could attend. Okay. So there are only two reasons why a woman goes to college in these types of situations. One is to find a mate, which is the number one reason. Mm -hmm. And two is to study something that's under the list of professions that women should be allowed to be in, according to these philosophies, right? So my sister was in her fourth year at this college. Um, the only reason she was allowed to go is because we had used some of the homeschool textbooks from this place. And so it was well known throughout the independent fundamental Baptist cult community um, about this school. There's, there's usually only two, th- three that you can go to, um, one being the school that I went to. So my sister was already there, and that's why I was allowed to go. Mm. To me, it was an escape it was a way to leave home. There was no other way I was going to leave. Um, my parents actually to this day have my original birth certificate, so I don't have that. But they kept all of our documents under lock and key. So there was no way I was going to run or they made sure of that. So going to this college was a way for me to leave home. And that was truly the only reason why I went to this specific place I don't really know much about it other than my sister made some friends and she seemed happy. So that's why I went. Uh, At this point in my life, I was severely anorexic Mm. uh, to the point that um, it was visibly evident that I was not okay and probably should have been taken to a hospital immediately. That's, That's where I was at. And I don't think I would have survived if I didn't go to this place. Would I reattend here? Probably not. But it was a way for me to leave home and get away from the physical abuse, actually meet people who were good people. Mm -hmm. And I'm still friends with some of them to this day. But I don't think I was really that focused on education, really. I I just wanted to leave home so bad that if this was the way to do it, I was going to do it. Yeah. So that's what brought me there. That makes yeah. complete sense. And I don't know why I didn't even consider that as an option, but that happens a lot in other groups as well, um, other Christian groups, especially with Mormonism. We talk about BYU, Brigham Young University, the Mormon College in Utah, and we did a whole episode on it and the amount of comments that were like, you knew the school policies. If you didn't like it, why did you go? And I'm like, okay, bro, it's not that simple. Usually their parents say, this is where you're going or this is all we can afford because it's pretty inexpensive, especially if you're Mormon. But the rules are just astounding and awful. And so, yeah, I can understand. And also the other reason is to get the MRS degree, the Mrs. degree, find your husband. So, okay. So you're at this school. Is that kind of the time where, because you're not emotionally invested in this religion, or at least it doesn't seem that you are, you're just in survival mode. Is that when you started to figure out 
what's going on with you. I need to make a change. I need to escape this environment. What What are you thinking here? Not really. And, and to be quite honest with you, at this point, I was still making excuses for my parents. Mm, um, okay. I was fully bought into their lie. And I was so afraid, I think, of God, really, at this point in my life. I was afraid if I was out of line, something would happen. Or if I didn't obey my parents, then something would happen. Um, you know, and going to this college was obeying my parents because it was the only one I was allowed to go to. So I would say I was very relig- I was very religious when I went to this school. Um, and during my time there, and even it, a few years after leaving, because I, I didn't actually graduate from this school, I was very judgmental. Uh, while I knew that some of the things my parents were saying, I, I wasn't sure about, but when you're taught to what to believe and what to think, or even when you can drink water or go to the bathroom your whole life, you don't really think for yourself. So at this point, I had adapted a lot of their philosophies and thinking, and I was very judgmental towards people. And I did look down on people. I was the person who would look down on someone for not wearing a dress to church. That was me. So I became that. I wasn't fully vocal about abuse going on in my home. I knew things my dad did to me that were blatant abuse, like throwing fists and things like that was wrong, but everything else, the emotional manipulation, even down to the sex trafficking, I wasn't willing to admit that my mom was wrong for this. There was just so much control still happening. Mm-hmm. This is hard to explain. I wasn't fully on board with what they were teaching, but at the same time, it was kind of like I didn't really stop to think for myself. Um, and I had adapted a lot of those religious traditions. So that's kind of where I was at from the time I was a freshman at the school until probably about two, three years after leaving the college. I know from watching some of your videos on your Instagram that you had a hell of an experience as a flight attendant and you were still very much in that survival mode. Mm -hmm. I do think it's an important part of your story. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, So becoming a flight attendant, I think, was very mind shifting for me. It was the first time that I had ever truly became friends with someone in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Because before then, you didn't talk to anybody else unless you were trying to convert them, right? Right. So this was where I would sit on 12 plus hour flights next to someone that I would be forbidden to even speak to before and listen to their stories, hear their experiences. And that's what really started to shift my thinking like, Mm -hmm. oh, they're they're people just like me. We aren't any different. And hearing their stories, and a lot of them grew up in church, and a lot of them were still very, very devoted to their faith. I realized that the way I was viewing things was very twisted and wrong. But during my time as a flight attendant, I had a specific experience um, where I was traveling because I was an interpreter um, from Minnesota to Tokyo. And there was a family on board that just had some behavior that was really strange. It was a man, a child, and a woman. And, you know, it's not uncommon for people to travel back home or go on vacation or that's something we'd see all the time. A lot of military families would travel and a lot of blended families would travel. So that was nothing new to me. I didn't think that was weird at all. What was strange to me is that every time the woman and the ch- well, the child was never allowed to go by themselves, neither was the woman. But anytime either of them needed to go to the bathroom, the man had to follow them to the bathroom, wait for them, hold their belongings, and then come back to the seat with them, mm-hmm. which is one of the red flags that we're taught to look for is passengers, especially grown adults who don't have any personal belongings on an international flight. And people who are not allowed to be in control of the items that they have with them. And so I thought it was really weird that this kept happening anytime they needed to go to the bathroom. And when you're on a 12 plus hour flight, it's not uncommon for you to give your child something to play with, stuffed animal, maybe it's an iPad, a book to read, something. This kid had absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. He's probably about eight years old. 
He wasn't even allowed to watch TV on a screen in front of him. He just had to sit there. Oh, torture. And I thought, man, this, it was. And I thought, man, I feel really bad. I'm, I'm grown and I would never want to sit on a yeah. flight like this. So I was trying to make conversation with him because I thought, oh, poor kid, you know, he's, he's bored out of his mind. So I'd, I'd lean over and I'd try to talk to him and wave to him and the man would interrupt and be like, okay, I'm just asking if maybe he'd want a snack or something to drink. Never allowed to respond to me. I thought, oh, that's weird. And then I brought this up to my flight leader and I thought, you know, this is, this is weird. Something is really off here. He's not allowed to speak. He's, did, neither of them are allowed to go to the bathroom. Something, something is off. And the way that they were sitting, the man was in the aisle and the two of them were by the window. So they could not get up unless he was out of his seat. Mm -hmm. So we started asking them questions. Like when we made our rounds with the drinks, we were asking different questions to each of them. The, the woman would speak every now and then, but the child never would. And the answers they gave us were completely different each time. One of them said they were going on vacation. Another one said they're visiting family. One of them said they lived in the States. The other one said they didn't live there. And we would ask things like, well, where does he go to school? And they would say, oh, he goes to school here. And then when we'd say, oh, is he shy? He's like, well, he doesn't speak English. Well, how long has he been in school? Oh, his whole life. Right. How old is he? Oh, he's 10. Well, how old is he? He's eight. So the story kept changing. And I, I thought, this is weird. Something is off. So I called the captain and I said, I think we've got at least something suspicious that we should check into here. I think it might be a trafficking situation. But we were told not to bother them, to leave them alone. And when they got up from the flight, the end of the flight, never forget this. The man stood up. Okay, they are towards, towards the middle front section of the plane. So there are hundreds of people behind them. They all have connecting flights. They got places to go. He stands up, holds everybody back behind him, doesn't let anyone pass, makes sure that the woman and the child are in front of him. He's still holding their passport and belongings. They have nothing, no personal belongings. And he follows them off the plane. And I just remember as I was waving at the kid, I looked down. I will never forget the way he looked at me. And it's... It's something that really pushed me to get into anti-human trafficking. Yeah. Um, and I actually called, there's a hotline that we can call um, as crew members it's called Blue Lightning. And I called them once I got to my hotel and I explained what was, what was going on. I gave them the connecting flight because they were going to Thailand, gave them their clothing descriptions, everything. And the last thing I heard from the hotline number the recep um, receptionist on the phone was, thanks for this information, but I don't know if there's anything else that we can do. Mm. And those words have haunted me uh, to this day. Um, they have really pushed me to be vocal. Um, and that's actually the whole reason I got into anti-human trafficking. Wow. You know, I, I never even thought to relate my story to human trafficking until I was actually training a group of people years later, I shared my story and someone explained to me what familial trafficking was, but that's, that's where I got started. And, and yeah, it's, it's sad that it happens and it happens more than we realize it happens every day. So, yeah, I'm yeah. so glad again that you have this platform and you're spreading this awareness and that you are able to be eyes and ears in situations like that. And I'm sure you've probably handled things differently if at all you come across a situation that resembles yeah. the one previous. And all we can do is our best at any given time. And I think you did your right. best. And even at that point, you've mentioned on your stories that you were living in bathrooms and you were in your own survival mm -hmm. mode and you were just trying to figure out life. Yeah. And so I hope you don't feel guilty for that. And I hope you are able to just know that again we do the best that we can with the information that we have and the and the capability that we have the emotional availability that we have and sometimes it's really hard but you're definitely doing big things now so that's amazing i i want to talk about Thank you. what your consciousness side is what makes you happy joyful at peace yeah. kind of where you're at now yeah um well, life has definitely gotten a lot better than where I was many years ago. And even to the time where um, 
I cut all ties with my parents, which I, I don't have a relationship with them anymore. As of 2017, it it was hell to go through um, that first year, year and a half. But I'm I'm really grateful that they are no longer a part of my life and I can start to heal and actually think logically of various events that have taken place. But things that really bring me joy now are my pets. So I have three cats. Um, yeah, they're great. Uh, I also really enjoy lifting weights. Uh, nice. It's given me a sense of connection to my body yeah. and a way to grow. Um, I think that's another thing, even as an adult that I'm learning is, you know, when kids grow up in healthy environments, they're given responsibility and given a little bit of independence and liberty at a time, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to let a three-year-old, you know, go buy, go get an apartment and live <laughs> on their own. You're not going to do that. But when they're three, you might, you know, give them something to do. So that way they're proud of themselves. Yeah. Maybe when they're 16, they get their first job, something like that. They start learning and progressing. And I didn't really have a lot of those opportunities. So now as an adult, I'm finding many ways to heal my inner child. And mm -hmm. surprisingly, the gym has been one of those things where I get to see progress and I get to see strength form. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's been great. And I have some of the most amazing friends and people in my life now that have just been there for me, not just for the bad times, but to, to really celebrate the good in life because it's easy to forget, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm really, really grateful for what I have now. That's amazing. I love that you lift weights. What a good way to reconnect <laughs> with yourself, really, because, you know, the awareness, the consciousness that we talk about, it's about being present and being aware of your thoughts, being aware of what's around you, really being present, because when we're in those high control groups, like you said, they tell you what to think, how to think, how to behave, what to wear and all of that. You can't really make decisions for yourself. You can't listen to your own intuition, to your gut, and it creates this dissociation. So what better way to reassociate than lifting weights? Because if you are out of your body, you, you can't be out of your body and lift weights. <laughs> Let's just say that. You, yeah, no. you have to be present. Please don't do that. Yeah. yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. This might sound really strange, but another thing that's been very therapeutic is cursing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I, I try not to do this on, you know, my channel just because I, I understand that sometimes my stuff is being shown to churches who are trying to uh, to be a safe place. Okay. And so I'm, I'm or educational, you know, if this is being shown to a class or something, I want to be respectful of that. So I'm always careful, but um <laughs> I didn't start cursing until I started going to therapy. Yeah. And I remember what this is like really, sorry, this is like off topic, no, go but ahead. very funny story. <laughs> um, my therapist, she's like, sometimes you just need to be angry. And that is okay. Cause I'd held this in for so long. I'm like, I'm not an angry person. I'm fine. She's like, yes, but you're internalizing it. So sometimes you got to let it out in a contained, safe environment where you're not hurting other people. Yeah. So uh, after a couple months into this really intensive therapy, be right. I'm in the bedroom. And one day I'm thinking about something my mom did. And I had never given my permit self permission to be angry. Yeah. And all of a sudden, sorry, if you have to bleep this out, go for it. But I just start yelling, fuck you. mom!" <laughs> and my husband from the other room, he had never heard me curse before comes running in the bedroom. Yeah. And, Are you okay? He thought I was having a panic attack. And I was like, I have never felt better in my life. <laughs> yes. That's so good. So something, you, you got to let some of that out. I, I laugh about it now. But like, you know, when, when you're in that place for so long where you're taught what to think, believe, everything, and you, you got to let loose. Yeah. You've got to breathe. And it is okay to be angry. It is. But what's not okay, and this is something that I personally have experienced before, is to release that anger on people who've done nothing wrong to yeah. you. And so you've got to find a way to let it go in a safe environment. Maybe that's why I love lifting weights so much. I was going to say, you can just scream at the gym. You can just grunt. Whatever you want. No one's going <laughs> to say anything. <laughs> listen, listen to metal. Uh -huh. Whatever you got to do. Just let it go sometimes. <laughs> you just got to breathe. <laughs> That's so good. No, it's funny because I did an episode. Well, 
Okay, backtrack. You're not allowed to swear in Mormonism, so they come up with lots of funny oh, replacements, right. right? Like, gosh darn it. And I mean, that's one of the more <laughs> obvious, like, not weird yeah. ones, but flip is another big one. Like, oh, flip. Just funny stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I never really swore because that's just how I grew up. Even after I left the church, it just didn't feel right to me. It was like, eh. And so I did an episode with my now husband, and it was like my fiance's issues yeah. with my Mormon past. And one of the things he brought up is like, you never swear, and it feels good to swear. I will, I will <laughs> say, guys, I have, mm. I have dipped a few toes in the swear bucket oh. since then. <laughs> and he's looking over have a jar? at me like, <laughs> you have a jar? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I will second that. That every now and then it feels good to slip that in there because it's kind of a reclaiming your power thing, right? At least yeah. I've found, and Jonathan's gonna be like, yay, she's gonna swear now. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just, uh, it feels good sometimes. So I second that. And with yeah. that, all that sass and fun and power, taking back your power, let me get your Linda Listen moment, <laughs> your sassy yes, statement. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's, listen, Linda. Sometimes, sometimes when you leave a cult, it's okay to pray and then say your fuck yous. Okay, <laughs> it is okay to do that. Trust me, I do. I do both of them. But you gotta find a way to let it just breathe and let that tension go. Oh my gosh, this, yeah. it just came to me that we should have a shirt that says "fuck you, amen." <laughs> I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> Guys, let us know if you want that t-shirt. Oh, this was so good. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. It was so great. I know so many people are going to relate to it in a multitude of different ways. It was like a three topic kind of episode here, which was awesome. Let me tell everyone right now, go follow Asami and I'll put it on the screen and in the description below on TikTok, Instagram and Facebook at Asami underscore Dane spelled D-A- E H N and uh, go check out what she's doing over there. All right. Do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I do. I do. And like in all seriousness though, I, this is one of the things that I've gotten from some of you guys who um, follow both of us or who've, who've talked with me in the comments before is th this kind of almost a sense of guilt um, that you might have after leaving um, a cult, right? Or maybe you're redefining your faith, mm -hmm. whatever that means. And you might feel almost guilty if you are now practicing your faith, but you're not practicing it the same way as when you were in a cult. Um, just, just an example. Um, I am currently a practicing Christian, but I also don't see any problem with swearing or, you know, wearing shorts on a summer hot day or, you know, those types of things. You will have moments in your head that'll say that is a sin or that is wrong. You'll guilt trip yourself. And what I want you to do is take a moment and really think, is this something that whatever, whatever faith you practice, right? Because it may not be Christianity. Is this what this is, is this something I really believe or is this something someone told me to believe? And really question and challenge that. And if you mess up or, you know, you realize that you've ad adapted some of those not so healthy things, maybe it's something you realize like, ooh, that's, that's really icky. Like, uh, oof, I need to let this go. Like, this isn't cool. I believe this way. Give yourself some grace. You didn't know any better back then. You're learning. And I just want you to know that I'm so proud of you for taking those steps and giving your self that space to learn and unlearn those things takes a lot of work. And I, I just want you to know that I'm really proud of you if you're taking those steps. So yeah, you probably doing a lot better than you think you are. <laughs> That's beautiful advice. I love that. I don't see anything wrong with taking what resonates and leaving the rest. And especially yeah. when we live in such a black and white world, sometimes where when you leave a cult, which is a very black and white world, it's hard to kind of differentiate the grays and see what you're comfortable with. Yeah. So I think that's great advice, just feeling it out and what's right for you and what's the way that can 
cause the least amount of harm to myself or other people and what feels good yeah. and really take inventory because when you do and you come from that heart space and you come from that space of unconditional love instead of fear, things really start to come yeah. into focus. So oh, amazing. Well, this was so great. Thank you again. Thank you. Everyone go follow Asami. She's doing great work over there on her social media platforms. And if you want to support this podcast, just liking and sharing and commenting means the world. Leave some words of encouragement for Asami here. And if you want to support even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Um, our newest patrons, Shield Maiden, Paul, John, and Kay. Thank you so much for your contributions. It really really means a lot that you're willing to support me in that way, uh, a little monthly donation. And if you like this video, I'll put some videos down below that you may also want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. <laughs>